so a very beautiful afternoon to all after three days of lot of rain today we have seen the sun so a uh, very nice day to gather here i welcome you all to uh, today's lecture by our distinguished guest today <laughs> professor william ramses bishai a professor of medicine at the division of infectious diseases and co-director of john hopkins university center for tuberculosis research it is really an honor for me to welcome professor william bishai to niab one of the most well known tb researcher who has contributed over 300 papers with more than 28000 citations and several patents to his name professor bishai's major interest is uh, involve uh, tb pathogenesis mycobacterial uh, gene regulation and animal models of tb his recent work has led to second generation of bcg vaccine for tb and bladder cancer therapy and is being advanced towards clinical trial so uh, bill is a physician scientist he received his md phd from harvard medical school followed by residency at the bingham and women's hospital he was an infectious disease fellow at john hopkins school of medicine and did his hhmi post doctoral fellowship with fellowship with nobel laureate dr hamilton smith uh, you know for no, he is known for discovery of restriction enzymes and dna methylogenesis so bill served in several top leadership positions advisory activities and consultancy services including served as the founder director of hhmi funded kwazulu natal research institute in tuberculosis uh, in africa for tuberculosis and hiv which is called kerit uh, he co-chaired who stop tb partnership working group for new tb drugs he chaired american thoracic society advised a dozen of pharmaceutical companies including mark pfizer astrazeneca abbott baxter etc and he is a member of a number of scientific academies including american academy of microbiology infectious society of america american society for clinical investigation american thoracic society to name a few so on his entrepreneurial journey he co-founded two companies uh, named oncosting and sonovel to further develop and commercialize his uh, inventions and at the end i would uh, like to say that apart from being an uh, his illustrious academic career he is a wonderful human being and i am really delighted to uh, spend almost half a decade in his lab as a postdoctoral fellow i welcome bill to the podium to share his thoughts today Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. okay. If you long press this one is for laser, sir. Mm -hmm. This one next slide. This is for laser. If okay. you single press this one, it will go to the previous slide. Yeah. I'll have to long press to hold it. Thank you. Uh, Papa, thank you very much for your overly kind introduction. and also your false advertising the picture of me makes me look nice and young so thank you very much it's a privilege to be here with you it's my first time in hyderabad and um uh in spite of all the things papa said one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my career has been the privilege of some really wonderful postdoctoral fellows who've come from india to study uh in in my lab in the us and two of them are sitting here today papa and ruchi and um i was smart enough to let them do a few things that weren't written up in the grant they went a little to the side and it paid off so thank you papa thank you ruchi uh so today i want to tell you um about uh, two uh, different mycobacterial diseases that have divergent sex differences the first one uh, more common in women the second one more common in men so it's a two part talk so my first part is about non tuberculous mycobacteria and um when i got started uh in my research in tb it was in the early 90s 
And at the time, uh, there was very little funded research in TB, but the rates of TB were going up in New York City. And all of a sudden, the people who used to study leprosy started coming into the TB field. Now, 25, 30 years later, the dominant disease in the United States is not TB. Uh, it's non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Here you see the rates of non-tuberculous mycobacteria going up, the rates of TB in the United States going down. They're basically doubling every 10 years, and the same is happening in other parts of the world, including Australia. So now what's happening is the people who used to study TB are going to this new field, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So I think it's a growing area of interest and hopefully uh, can give you some information about this cluster of diseases. So um, non-tuberculous uh, mycobacterial pulmonary infection is a female biased infection. The risk factors uh, uh, are very closely related to having structural lung disease, a, a constellation of uh, symptoms of, of, of findings called bronchiectasis, where the airways uh, have been damaged and uh, become hyperinflated, and they can no longer clear infectious organisms th through the normal mucociliary elevator. The most common form of, uh, of uh, structural lung disease that uh, leads to uh, MTM infection is non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. And this accounts for 90% of the NTM disease we see in the United States. And it tends to be seen in the older female. There are some body habitus uh, abnormalities like spinal abnormalities and the um, sternal abnormalities shown here, and sometimes mitral valve prolapse and about uh, a sex ratio of 1.4 female to one male. The other causes of, non -C uh, of uh, uh, predisposing factors to NTM pulmonary disease uh, in NCFB category are these genetic disorders, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia and alpha-1 antitrypsin, again, diseases where the lung can no longer uh, clear bacteria or viruses that, uh, that come in. But uh, like cystic fibrosis, these are genetic diseases that are not X-linked, so they have a male-female ratio of uh, one to one. But as I said, uh, the dominant disease seen uh, in the US, and I believe uh, possibly here in India, is from the idiopathic form of non-CF bronchiectasis. So these non-tuberculous mycobacteria are a very diverse cluster of mycobacterial species. So here you see Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, which inclo includes Embovis, which I know a number of you study here in this uh, very incredible institution. Um, but here you see some of the 170 or so uh, known species of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. But don't be put off. There are really two that are important, Mycobacterium and Mycobacterium abscessus in the red. These are organisms that are readily found in soil, water. You can easily cultivate them from um, bathrooms and kitchens from uh, tap water. So they're abundant in the organism, in the environment. As you can see, at least in the United States, the places that have a lot of water have a lot of NTM. So the highest rates are in Hawaii. And as you see, these coastal areas, particularly in the south, have the majority of, of the NTM. So let me say a few words about um, um, Mycobacterium avium complex. There are actually uh, uh, four uh, subspecies of M. avium. Then there's also intracellulary and M. chimera. And this is the dominant form we see in the United States. The common misconception is that you can just clear these organisms with antibiotics the same way we treat tuberculosis, but that turns out not to be correct. These patients um, have abnormal airways and they need to have uh, airway clearance, uh, sometimes with physical um, uh, disruption against the chest to help mobilize the secretions, and also management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And very interestingly, the common, a couple of the common TB drugs don't work. Isonizide and pyrazinamide uh, don't work. 
Um, the majority of the drugs that we use to manage this disease are repurposed. Uh, some are tuberculosis drugs, some are other antibiotics. There's only one approved agent uh, that just uh, was approved uh, two years ago, inhaled amikacin. But uh, drug discovery for this uh, cluster of infections is still uh, in the works. And of course, just like with tuberculosis, we have to treat with multiple antibiotics, not just one. A very important um, way of uh, understanding these diseases is uh, through um, their, mic their macrolide susceptibility, whether or not they're susceptible to erythromycin. And um, there are two major forms, bronchonodular, which is the milder form, but sometimes cavitary lesions are seen and that's called fibrocavitary. And as you can see, um, if you are lucky enough to have uh, erythromycin susceptible bronchonodular, you might have um, uh, a, um, an 80% chance of, uh, of clearing your culture and, and being cured. And this could happen as early as 12 months, at least twice as long as it takes to treat tuberculosis. But if you have these cavities, your uh, success rate goes down dramatically. And if your strain is uh, macrolide resistant, not susceptible to erythromycin, it's very bad news. These patients have very low success rates. They're often treated for years um, uh, and they have to take these very complex regimens, some of which are intravenous drugs. Let me turn to M. abscessus. This one is a, even scarier. It's a rapidly growing mycobacterium. Avium takes three weeks to form a colony on a plate. This one takes uh, two to four days. Um, it's considered an antibiotic nightmare. You saw all the antibiotics just a moment ago for M. avium. This um, uh, more rapid growing mycobacterium is even more drug resistant and is much harder to treat. So as you can see here, you're, you're lucky if uh, you happen to have uh, uh, this uh, subspecies, Massiliensis, which uh, doesn't have erythromycin resistance um, as an inducible gene, so it's generally susceptible to erythromycin. These patients have somewhat improved outcomes. But for the other ones where erythromycin resistance is inducible, there's uh, the same low success rates that I mentioned before. So again, very complex regimens that these patients have to take. One of the lead drugs is given uh, intravenously. This can cause uh, kidney and uh, hearing toxicity. Uh, here's a drug that they uh, uh, are that patients have to take twice a day intravenously. Uh, and here's uh, linazolid, which uh, has significant suppression of bone marrow precursors and, and eye toxicity. And you can see that even in 2023, here's an infectious disease that we consider surgical resection for because of the poor success rate with antibiotics. One bright thing on the horizon for these very difficult uh, to treat mycobacterial infections is the advent of phage therapy. And so um, a leader in the field, Dr. Graham Hatful, um, has identified some um, uh, uh, phages that uh, will kill mycobacterium abscessus. He's uh, been involved in the treatment of uh, successful treatment of a couple of individuals in the top and uh, at the bottom. Uh, but sadly, sometimes the um, phages uh, induce an antibody response, which leads to compromised uh, treatment success. So um, phage cocktails are now being um, uh, uh, worked on by a number of pharmaceutical companies. Um, they typically involve at least three phages, um, each of which um, will work against the particular M. abscessus isolate. Uh, they can be given intravenously or inhaled, but as, I, as has been shown by the middle publications, uh, antibody responses can get in the way. But um, uh, it's exciting that this entirely new modality of treatment is, is being explored, not just by academics, but by, by big pharma. So um, NTM may be the future of mycobacterial research in the United States because of their um, rising incidence. Um, they're the dominant mycobacterial disease we face in the United States. Um, 
Avium is the most uh, common. Uh, it's important to refer these patients to specialists who know how to manage the antibiotics, their antibiotic toxicities, but also to work with airway clearance uh, and pharmacologists uh, in these complex regimens. And um, uh, not just antibiotics are needed, but other modalities. So I want to talk now um, about a disease I spend more of my time on, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which goes the other way. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, it's more common in men around the globe. Um, so uh, uh, as, um, as I'm sure you know, um, uh, it's a, a very a problematic uh, infection globally. Um, until COVID, we had the bragging rights to say that tuberculosis killed more individuals than any single infectious disease organism. Now I think we're tied with COVID with around 2 million deaths per year and maybe COVID will get out of the way and we can be number one again, um, which is a sad statement. Um, but uh, look at these sex ratios. Um, uh, the incidence in males, um, uh, 1.75 to 1, not only with occurrence of the disease, but also mortality of the disease. And if you look at these World Health Organization statistics, um, uh, there's some very interesting observations. First, uh, prior to puberty, the incidence is the same between uh, girls and boys. And after uh, menopause, the females are still protected against tuberculosis and males still have more TB. So uh, whatever is going on happens at the beginning of puberty, but lasts lifelong. And females uh, um, have a protection not only in the incidence of disease, but in death due to the disease. So one thing you might be asking is, is this just an epidemiologic aberrancy because women don't get to the doctor as frequently as men. Is, we live in a male dominated world, sad but true. Uh, is this an uh, epidemiologic accident? Well, I think the answer is no. Uh, here, for example, is a meta-analysis that involves 3.1 million participants, uh, 88 publications, 28 countries, that showed that females access TB healthcare more frequently and sooner than their male counterparts, even in, in poor countries. And it's one of many studies. So I don't think this is epidemiologic. What else could it be? So here are some clues that the male dominant uh, bias in, in tuberculosis could actually be biological. Number one, there was a a natural experiment, if you will, that occurred in 1929, a, a disaster where uh, 251 uh, children were accidentally inoculated with virulent tuberculosis instead of BCG at a hospital uh, in Lübeck, Germany. Look at the death rates. The boys died 36% of the time, the girls 27% of the time and this uh, was statistically significant. Here's another um, little snippet of observation. In the United States, uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, children who were, uh, this is a politically incorrect term, but the title of the paper actually called them mentally retarded, were put in institutions and to manage their behavior, some of the boys were castrated and made into eunuchs. This group looked over this 50 year period of time and found that among the um, uh, eunuchs, the castrated boys, there was a, an 8.1% TB mortality rate as opposed to 20.6 among the gonadally intact. That is, if you uh, no longer had testicles and made testosterone, you were protected from tuberculosis. And again, a statistically significant P value. But beyond this, it's widely known that the sex hormones uh, have important immunologic functions. Testosterone decreases T cell function as well as B cell function, whereas the opposite is true of estrogens. The X chromosome um, encodes a number of immunologic genes, including uh, two toll-like receptors um, and uh, other uh, very important antigens, uh, 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 genes that control immune function. 
And in, on top of that, there's this interesting phenomenon where the normal process of one female X chromosome being inactivated doesn't always occur. And it's been shown uh, predominantly in cancer that in some uh, cancer protective genes, both X chromosomes are active. There is escape from X chromosome inactivation, giving females a double gene dose of these cancer protective genes, whereas males only have one X chromosome and can't benefit from that. Could that be playing a role in uh, the male bias and tuberculosis? And of course, what I'm telling you isn't really that newsworthy. Uh, many other infectious diseases, including other bacterial diseases, viral diseases, including COVID-19, uh, fungal diseases, and parasitic diseases, show a male bias uh, in more incident cases. So here's just a, um, a very busy slide just to remind you that all cells um, uh, in the immune system have effects on them from the sex hormones. As I was mentioning, estrogens uh, show um, uh, elevated levels of, um, of uh, these important um, uh, pro-antipathogen uh, functions, whereas, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, B cells uh, are, um, are, are more um, mature, matured in females and, and less so in, in testosterone. And with T cells, a plethora of changes that are hormonally mediated. But on the other side of the coin, the sex chromosomes could also be playing a very important role. Um, X chromosome is a busy chromosome with lots of immunologic genes, whereas um, the Y chromosome has a lot of wasted space, if you will. It only encodes 200 genes, um, and, uh, and none are known to play a role in the immune system. And as I mentioned before, there's this very interesting phenomenon of uh, escape from X uh, chromosome inactivation and skewed gene silencing. Could any of these play a role in the male bias in tuberculosis? So I wanna tell you about um, an interesting mouse model that we've had the opportunity to apply to this question. And the model was uh, really pioneered by this gentleman, Arthur Arnold, and uh, carried on by Sabra Klein at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, who is my collaborator. And Sabra has investigated this animal model against a number of uh, viral infections um, and has been generous in working together with me to look at the same model in tuberculosis. It's called the four core genotype. And uh, what has happened over the years is successful isolation of, um, of male mice where there's been a translocation of the testes determining locus called SRY, which is normally located on the Y chromosome, uh, deleted from the Y chromosome and translocated onto the X chromosome. So to conduct this model, uh, one crosses normal female mice, XX female mice, with these SRY translocated male mice. And what happens is you get normal XX uh, gonadal female mice, you get XY uh, gonadal uh, male mice, which is all as it should be, but you get these two uh, genotypes in the middle. You get XY mice that have uh, female gonads and XX mice that have male gonads. So you get four different types of mice. And this allows one to tease apart sex chromosome effects where here in this column, all the mice have XX in this column, all the mice have XY from gonadal effects where here all the mice are gonadally female and here all the mice are gonadally male. So by challenging these mice and looking at the phenotypic results, one can ask uh, 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 salient questions about whether it's sex chromosomes, um, uh, uh, go gonadal effects uh, uh, from the hormones or it's the sex chromosome complement that are the main drivers of the difference. So uh, we needed about 50 mice uh, from each of these four core genotypes. And, that meant a lot of work. And I, 
uh, fortunately have this wonderful postdoctoral fellow who did his uh, training uh, at ICDEB in New Delhi, Manish Gupta. And Manish uh, accepted the, uh, the, the challenge and um, began uh, breeding the mice and then doing the requisite tail sniffs to identify what's going on. And here's just what, what he had to do with the genital male mice. Um, so at the top, you see a PCR fragment that corresponds to the retained part of the Y chromosome that's present in all of these uh, male mice, uh, gonadally male mice. But here's the translocation, the middle one. It's uh, uh, present here, so this is an XY gonadal male, but it's absent here, so this is an XX gonadal male. And at the bottom, you see the myoglobin control. So he pulled this off and we had um, a few dozen of each of the four core genotypes. So uh, our next step was to start looking at tuberculosis phenotypes. So in my opinion, the best um, assay to study uh, phenotypic responses uh, on the host side is the mouse time to death study. So um, Manish infected um, uh, all the four core genotypes. Uh, he implanted about 1.8 logs, a little shy of 100 CFU in the lungs of, uh, of each of the mice and just watched them and waited. And here you see he got a striking phenotypic result. In uh, purple, you see the gonadal females had a dramatic extension of life in contrast to the gonadal males in green who died significantly faster between 17 and 20 weeks as opposed to uh, 35 and 42 weeks. But beyond the um, protection of being a gonadal female, there was also a modest sex chromosome effect. So the um, among the females, if you had a genetic Y chromosome, um, uh, uh, these triangles, you died a little bit sooner as opposed to the XX gonadal females in the purple circles who had the longest survival time. So here, right off the bat, we knew that uh, gonadal males did worse, suggesting a hormonal effect. But within the gonadal groups, the presence of the Y chromosome conferred a slightly worse outcome in tuberculosis challenge. The next step was to do the harder uh, uh, infectious uh, characterization of actually um, uh, doing a lot more with the tissues. So same experiment, harvesting the tissues at four and 12 weeks. And I'll show you um, uh, bacterial colony forming units in lung and spleen. What we've done so far was with histopathology and uh, where we are with evaluating uh, phenotypic uh, profiles of the cytokines from these four core genotypes. So lung bacterial burdens uh, fortunately confirmed what we saw with time to death. Uh, gonadal females uh, at the four weeks following infection had statistically significantly lower counts than gonadal males. Same was true at 12 weeks, but a much larger difference. And here we didn't see uh, the the uh, worse outcomes within the X within the Y containing uh, subgroups. It seemed to go in terms uh, along the lines of the gonadal uh, phenotype of the mice. Uh, so gonadal males again did worse, but within the gonadal groups there was no difference whether you had an XY or an XX. And I'm not showing you the spleen CFU counts, but they looked very similar and had the same um, basic conclusion. What about the, uh, the lung pathology? So here are standard H&E uh, stains. Here you see the gonadal females and the gonadal males at four weeks. Uh, hard to see if there's really any difference, but then 12 weeks uh, at the more lengthy time point, there's significantly more lost airway space among the gonadal males compared to the gonadal females. And here are the uh, quantitative analyses by looking at multiple uh, whole lung slices and counting granulomatous regions uh, per lobe. So you see that the uh, gonadal females, whether XX or XY, had uh, fewer of these tuberculous granulomatous lesions than did the gonadal males. And it didn't matter about the, 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 sex, uh, the, the sex chromosomes XY 
as a sub analysis. Then we, uh, Manish did some, um, some uh, immunohistochemical staining and um, I'm showing you first uh, the CD4 staining, a really dramatic difference. Uh, the gonadal female mice, XY females or X, X females had significantly more uh, CD4 uh, staining pockets than did the gonadal male mice. Here you see some blow-ups. Um, and um, this has recently uh, been confirmed by flow cytometry, significantly a higher abundance of CD4 cells uh, in the gonadal females. Here are CD8 counts, same result, much more staining of CD8 in the gonadal females, um, whether XX or XY. Here you see some nice blow ups. Uh, and this again has also been confirmed by flow cytometry. Then Manish. Um, did an interesting experiment. He looked at um, staining with uh, the B22220 uh, antibody that uh, stains B cell follicles. And uh, among the gonadal females, you see that the XX females had a lot of these B cell follicles and fewer in the XY females and very few at all in the gonadal males. And here you see some nice uh, blow ups. And here, Looking at it statistically and actually counting regions, um, Manish showed that there were far more B cell follicles in the XX gonadal female mice. So here's um, a phenotypic parameter that broke down just by one of the four cores. The gonadal female mice seemed to have the most of these B cell follicles. Uh, and this was uh, true whether um, uh, we looked at total area uh, or total uh, uh, lesion structures. Finally, I want to show you some cytokine data. Um, we Manish did a total of 23 different cytokines. I won't um, put you through the paces of looking at all of them, but we found different phenotypes. So here we found that uh, with TNF, uh, higher levels in the gonadal males for the most part, uh, IL-1 alpha pro-inflammatory cytokine, slightly higher in the, in the gonadal males. Um, uh, type 1 interferon, interferon beta, really didn't differ across uh, MCP1, seemed to have this unique uh, elevation uh, among the uh, XX female mice, at least at the four-week uh, time point. So to try to make a long story short with the cytokines, in gonadal males, we found higher uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF being the predominant one. In gonadal females, higher IL-23 and CCL4, and I'll come back to that. I can't explain why um, there was more MCP1 in the XX uh, mice. MCP1 is not an X-encoded gene, but we have that result. And here are a long laundry list of genes known to be important in the control of TB, but there was no difference across the four core genotypes. So I want to return to this observation of B cell follicles. Um, they're really not that well studied in tuberculosis. In fact, if you do a literature search uh, of B cell follicles, those this very same word cluster, B cell follicles and tuberculosis, you only find 21 papers. Um, to summarize what they say, um, in relatively resistant mouse substrains like C57 black 6, there are more of these B cell follicles and they last for longer. And because these are TB resistant mice, that seems to be correlating with a good thing. Studies that have uh, depleted B cells by antibody mediated depletion show that uh, MTB CFU counts go up. If you deplete B cells genetically, uh, mice die early. So this sort of leads to the, uh, the conclusion that maybe the B cell follicles are a good thing and that they have a protective effect in tuberculosis. Uh, and then a very interesting paper was published by Shabana Cotter 12 years ago uh, when she was a postdoctoral fellow. And she showed that IL-23 was required for B cell follicles and that the mechanism was that it leaded to an increase in the, the chemokine CXCL13 and that with increased uh, CXCL13, there seemed to be higher levels of T cell migration from the vasculature uh, to the lungs where they could actually fight the infection. And 
to be 100% honest, we're not the first to observe this B cell uh, follicle phenomenon. It was actually reported by a German group, uh, uh, first author David Hertz back in 2020, looking at standard XY mice. And so I would uh, say that our, our results extend what Hertz originally discovered. Um, we found that the B cell follicles are uniquely more abundant just in this one of the four core uh, uh, genotypes, the wild type females, the XX female, gonadally intact XX females. And so this would indicate that uh, B cell follicle formation is inhibited in both of the genotypes that are gonadal male, but also uh, in the gonadal females that have a Y chromosome. And to come back to Shavana Cotter's observation, um, I showed you this panel before, IL-23 actually was uniquely higher in the uh, uh, XX female mice than it was in any of the three uh, of the four core genotypes. And the chemokine that seems to be dependent on IL-23, uh, perhaps there's a trend towards uh, higher levels, but as you can see, there's a lot of spread here and it was not statistically significantly different. So this is an observation that we definitely would like to follow up on. It leads to some testable hypotheses. Can we uh, deplete IL-23 in the female mice and show that they have a higher risk of tuberculosis? Can we add IL-23 to the male mice and see if it helps protect them from tuberculosis? So to summarize this second and final part of the talk, um, we got our hands on this um, uh, slightly unusual um, mouse model, the four core genotype model, and used it to uh, characterize, uh, uh, ask the question, why is there more uh, TB um, uh, incidence among males? And we found that uh, gonadal male mice, whether they were XX or XY, uh, uh, had more lethality and higher bacterial counts. And this strongly suggests that the hormonal effects of, uh, of having testes and the uh, male hormones is the primary mediator of increased risk of TB uh, and of T increased progression of TB disease. Um, and there was this interesting secondary effect that uh, being XX was protective with each gonadal group, suggesting that maybe there is a, a secondary chromosomal effect. Um, uh, gonadal males have worse pathology scores and gonadal females seem to benefit um, by having higher CD4 and CD8 T cells. And then we found this interesting phenomenon of higher B cell follicles, follicles uniquely in the XX female mice. Um, uh, and that's something we definitely would like to follow up on. So thank you very much for inviting me here. It's been a real delight to visit with you. Um, and, and I wanna thank the people who did the work that I showed you, particularly uh, Manish Gupta, a very talented postdoc who you'll be hearing more from. I'm sure he's got a bright career ahead of him. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Will, for the wonderful talk. And I think uh, in our audience, uh, this is a nice talk of mixing infection biology with reproduction biology. A lot of people, a lot of students might have questions, so sorry, open for question now. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, nice talk. So, uh, one question I have I know that the antibodies are not in the important TB. Have you checked antibody levels on this? No, but we have it on the list. Uh, that was AIM 2B in the grant that finally, after multiple tries, came out of this. Um, so, we would like to look. Sabra Klein um, has done a lot of work um, with the influenza uh, uh, infection of this four core genotype model. Females have higher antibody levels by far than males, whether or not it's to influenza vaccination uh, or actual influenza challenge. So the conventional wisdom in TB has been that antibodies aren't important, but um, We've been listening to the conventional wisdom for 30 years, and there's still a lot of tuberculosis. So I think it needs to be investigated. Thank you. So I completely agree with the last one. That we do have to look at the antibody bar also. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, to the first part of NDM. 
the general observation that we are ready is a simple survey like the bad industry. And most of the initiatives are environmental initiatives. So do you think it might have happened because they might have acquired a lot of uh, this antibiotic resistant genes from the environmental transfer and eventually have become is that uh, how it has been and therefore they are like becoming successful but in a very specific population. So yeah, well, I, I think that we underestimate um, how much bacterial uh, warfare there is in the environment, you know, to survive in, in a body of water or in the soil, you have other bacteria competing. And so um, this or these organisms have obviously done very well. Interestingly, um, their mechanisms of resistance uh, differ from MTB. For example, the mechanism of rifampin resistance is completely different. Um, how they would be naturally resistant to isoniazide is a mystery that I, at least I don't know the answer to because isoniazide is not a natural product. It's a chemical entity that was invented by chemists. Um, so I think these are bugs that have had to see all the polyketide macrolide antibiotics that other organisms can make and have survived. And, and that's why they're going to be a challenge. This might be excessive E. coli metabolites that are being released and that's how it might happen. Yeah. So I think that would be an interesting area. For the second part, I was uh, just curious about this iron friendly tea. And somebody should correct me if I'm, if I'm not thinking like right. Uh, maybe Francis will also should tell me. So I twenty three is the same type of iron group as I twelve. Am I correct in saying that? Anybody here? If I recall, do they have to have so? I, I think it shares the um, IL twelve P forty uh, one of the chains, and then has a, a second different chain. So it, would it have any impact that way? Because IL twelve has some fairly well established cytokine which uh, kind of stimulates this cascade from helper T7, then I have gamma and gamma. Yeah, yeah, so certainly, uh, as you well know, um, uh, IL-12 deficiencies have been described and that predispose people to tuberculosis. Um, uh, I think it'll be interesting to look at that shared um, uh, that P40 uh, expression levels. Perhaps that gives females an advantage that they uh, have elevated levels. We certainly didn't pick it up by looking at IL-12 levels. Those were equivalent, but we didn't look specifically at, at P40, so it, it's worth looking at. Both the subunits are higher, and there are more people, 40 than the females may have a tendency and yeah. have an additional advantage. So is there any report that IL-23 is also doing similar thing like IL-12, uh, or they are uh, well, not very clear? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that IL-23 has been um, uh, uh, studied in the context of inflammatory diseases, and there's um, there are antibodies that um, protect against inflammatory diseases like um, uh, inflammatory arthritis. Um, and um, so I, I know we're going to be able to find antibodies to, to deplete for mice and certainly for other species, but um, and, and you can obviously buy the, the cytokine and use it to supplement. So I, I think that's going to be worth looking at. Um, another obvious thing that these data um, suggest that we should do is gonadectomize the mice, supplement the various sex hormones, and see if we can change one phenotype to the other. So we have um, a lot of interesting work to do, and we were delighted to get this very strong phenotype at the beginning. Or also correlating whatever condition I already is high with the female bias. Yeah, yeah. And I think these B-cell follicles, um, they've been a little bit of a, and, and all of antibodies, you know, They've been dismissed by the field, and and that that's probably been at our own peril. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So uh, in the U.S., like to increase the beach production, we are making this uh, XX female uh, with the SRV. Do you think can we see a kind of a susceptibility of the Mycobacterium, the bovines, which infects the bovine, uh, in this kind of genetically modified. Yeah, I certainly don't know if uh, if Mycobacterium bovis or aurigis is more common in male bulls than in uh, cows, but I think it was worth looking at. Do you know? <laughs> so, uh, 
things together. The thought that's coming to me is uh, when you look at livestock, especially cattle, these all female because uh, because the purpose of this cattle rearing is mainly meat production in India, especially. So we do not have that many bulls to look at to have a statistically significant study on this. So we do not have any data. But now in US, there is a lot of male, uh, uh, basically the bulls for meat purpose studies. Uh, uh, there will be sufficient numbers to look at. But I think those farms, they are strict enough to cull at, right at the beginning. Yeah. Otherwise, those farms cannot serve. Yeah. So that possibility is very rare. Uh, of getting uh, certain infections spreading because of uh, this kind of genotype because they are screened uh, very well very strictly. And, and yeah, I, I think that these uh, bulls are or the males are castrated early in their you know, life. Yeah, so point. maybe, you know, the testosterone. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, so accidentally we're doing them a favor in tuberculosis <laughs> and bovis prevention. Yeah. That's a very good question. And, you know, if you had me here next week, I would have the data. Um, so Gupta told me he was getting the data this week. I don't know yet. But it's an obvious thing to do. Thank you. And also, do you think uh, the pathogenic infections actually alter uh, the taxonomy production in the Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. And, you know, I, um, uh, it's a good reminder to us that um, we, we have to have an uninfected arm that we monitor the hormones in. Because if we only look at infection, uh, we won't be able to say whether infection alters the hormonal uh, abundance. And, and very frequently you see in these TB models, nobody leaves the uninfected mice or whatever animal they're studying because it's, you know, why they're healthy. But I think we're going to need them, especially in this four core model, because we, we'll need to have a baseline level. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, but uh, going to the second part, I somehow understood that the first part was kind of contradictory to me that ending with more with uh, or causing more towards females. Even though through the second part we saw that females are more uh, you know, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think there's a genetic basis to it. There have been a number of GWAS studies in that non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis population where there are more females to get NTM disease. Um, and, and they have these, these um, skeletal abnormalities um, and also things like mitral valve prolate, suggesting that there's a genetic um, underlying uh, effect, but it hasn't been teased out to my knowledge. So I think it's immunogenetic. Um, and another th interesting thing about it is um, these individuals who get non-NTM disease, they're frequently over the age of 50. So whatever it is, it happens late and it's associated with uh, structural lung disease and inability of the airways to normally clear, which sets the stage for these relatively weak pathogens. You know, if you give M. avium or M. abscessus to a normal mouse, it laughs at the infection, it goes, the infection is cleared. So these are opportunistic pathogens that need to have a defective host. And I, I believe those females who get it have an immunogenetic abnormality that we haven't been smart enough to figure out yet. Um, but there's clearly a difference uh, across the two mycobacteria. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, Bill. I just wanted to ask one question about the regarding your second part. So one new way when you were saying that testosterone could lead to mycobacterial infection, right? So is it possible that if you suppress the testosterone mm -hmm. probably during the period of your treatment? So will it help in clearing the bacteria from the body? Yeah, it's a very good uh, question. And um, we had the idea um, that, you know, um, there are certain 
natural populations where this could be asked. Like men who have prostate cancer undergo chemical castration to lower their testosterone levels. So, you know, it wouldn't work in the United States where there's so little TB. But if you had a nationwide database um, that was in a country that has a relatively large amount of TB, which you have the potential to do here in India, um, even an insurance database, you could ask that question. Um, you know, are men who have various forms of castration, chemical or, or actual surgical, um, protected uh, from tuberculosis? The other um, population we, we talked about are pa pa patients who have transgender surgery. Um, again, I, I think transgender surgery happens in places where TB rates are low, so that might not be the most realistic population. I know that was uh, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. So uh, I have a question that usually, as you mentioned in humans, like uh, this uh, dimorphic nature of TB attacking male or female, sexually dimorphic. So after puberty, you don't see that. So when you look into this focal model, uh, do you have any experimental plan to write from the journal, give the uh, this bacteria and look for the pathway for other possibilities? In in prepubertal animals. Exactly. Uh, that's a good, you know, I don't even know when mice become sexually mature. I think it takes about four weeks, eight yes, weeks. Yes, exactly. After 21 days, you need them, and on 30 days, they'll be active. Yeah. On the third day onwards, they're active. Yeah. That's a tricky one because um, uh, the, the infection itself, uh, you know, the, when we infect the mice, it takes the, the bug grows the same rate in in a flask as it does in the lung for the first four weeks. It just doubles uh, every um, uh, doubles every day, a log every two weeks. And so there's not enough time in that window to really ask the question, um, but you got me thinking. It's a good question. Yeah, I have another question. Right now you're talking about uh, like testosterone on the endocrine systems. So when you look into this endocrine systems, basically men versus women, they're different completely. So nowadays there are a number of reports are coming out completely, I mean, not completely, at least 50% of them depends on the gut composition. Have you thought about it? Reporting yeah. to that so I've given this talk, uh, this is the second time in my life I've given this talk. And the first time I got that same question. Have you looked at the microbiota? And I said, no, why? So do you have some data as to why we might find a difference? Exactly, within females or within males, for example, the set, I mean, the difference in microbiota differently regulates the testosterone level in public. So why not the case with this? Okay, uh, I have to talk to you later and get those references. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a small query. Um, I believe gluten tyrosine kinase gene is on the X chromosome. Have you looked at it at all? Or? Yeah, no, I, when we, we wrote this up, I was really hoping it would be genetic. I, I like molecular biology. Um, I'm a little disappointed it's hormonal, but <laughs> uh, so we haven't, we haven't really done any um, RT PCR or analysis of gene expression. Um, uh, well, I take it back. Gupta's a smart guy. He, he sent off uh, 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 whole lung homogenates uh, for uh, RNA sequencing. So we'll get, you know, the big picture from a multicellular organ for each of the four core genotypes. And we'll have the opportunity to ask that question, uh, whether it differs across the four cores. But we don't have the data back yet. It's pending. Thank you. I'll, I'll look for that one. So, uh, good talk. My question is this, that how come I mean, this X chromosome activation, the zystogene, so how come this zystogene is uh, possible for this uh, sense of I Yeah. Thought, uh, yeah, no, I have no evidence that 
uh, escape from X chromosome inactivation occurs in tuberculosis and protects females. Um, I do think it's a very interesting mechanism that has been shown. Uh, a number of cancers are more abundant in men than in women, the majority of cancers. Um, and, um, and in certain cancers, um, tumor suppressor genes that are on the y chromo uh, X chromosome have been shown to be active on both copies due to escape from X, X inactivation. So the, the females get a double gene dose uh, of of a uh, tumor suppressor gene. Uh, so it's speculation that it might happen in TB. Um, the molecular biologist in me is, is hoping, but we have no data. Uh, so I have one question uh, about the BCG vaccinated uh, So is there any report of levels of IL23 or CPL4 in those scenarios where vaccinated uh, animals or? Yeah, there probably is, and I haven't done my homework. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, I can uh, join you there. So I yeah. 23 increases, and uh, I'll 4, I'll 10, I'll 13, they normally get something. What about I can gamma? I can gamma increases. Uh, because but in your presentation it. says I can gamma doesn't play much role here in this. It, it didn't show any. Um, yeah, it was a, the same across, the, it went up. But it was the same across the four cores. Okay. Yeah, but we we should look and we could test it experimentally. We we do enough BCG vaccinations to uh, we, we haven't BCG vaccinated the four cores yet. There's um, uh, some interesting data from uh, the Dutch group headed by Nutia that um, uh, BCG responses in females are better than than in males. Um, so. You know, maybe they're lucky on that account too. Okay. Yeah, so only um, the the spleen CFU counts at four and twelve weeks um, uh, looked at almost exactly the same, although the numbers were lower uh, in the spleens. So um, and. We did some pathology on the spleens. It reflected the CFU counts, more lesions when there were higher CFU counts, but we haven't done a careful analysis of extra pulmonary spread. So, uh, there's a uh, question about the national tuberculosis elimination program in India proposes that the EB would be eradicated by 2025 from India. So what, do you, what is your take on this? No, I think they changed it to 2035. And they gave themselves enough. And, you know, I think if I come back in 2033, they might have changed it by another. But, you know, it's a disease uh, that the big pharma companies don't see a motivation for. Look what happened with COVID. You know, so many vaccines and, and now drugs so fast. I think that's the sad truth. You know, this is something we could overcome with drugs. And I, I'm a little hesitant to say uh, vaccines, you know, we, there's some efficacy that BCG does a lot, um, but there may be some diseases that are not fully vaccine preventable. Um, so I think TB is gonna be a hard one to get high uh, success rates of prevention, but any dent, by a vaccine would be a good thing. So with with prevention and with treatment, we're we're behind. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And what we are looking for, we can do a much more uh, general of the data and problem data. So I'm just wondering when you coded the disease for gen, uh, do we understand that as long as we still are layers of time? Uh, which is better. So as uh, it gets depleted, this one. Uh, but your data doesn't show. Yeah, we. I mean, I, I. I hope to have the really clean data on the on the sex hormones. I will say that during pregnancy, estradiol levels go up, but uh, TB risk goes up too. So it's not. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. The progesterone shoots up. The progesterone shoots up. Yeah. So uh, no, I'm not talking about the pregnant data. 
pregnancy data, but uh, also say the young ones having the higher histone, or those animals which have higher histone, or late on less, uh, or say the human population as well. So, uh, what is the comment? Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if it we could account for the on the sex hormonal basis alone. But one of the first slides was even after menopause, the women seem to have a protective effect. Uh, that's what I want to yeah. Yeah. point to all the discussion about the different chunks. Uh, the menopause women should have more of it. Yeah, but you know, the World Health Organization data seem to support that females continue to be protected even postmenopausally. Um, so, you know, I, it's a simplification to show you that graph that's global. Um, they've broken it down by countries. Some countries have much higher incidence than men, some it's narrower, but the trend holds across most countries. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, thank you very much. And also like uh, with your statement and all that, do you, guys, uh, do you have any idea or would you like to comment on what exactly is the data for TB and the pregnant children or something? Yeah. Any yeah. Like no, I think it's understudied and very important. Um, and um, my, I have a new boss um, uh, whose name is Amita Gupta, and she has a, a, a big cohort of pregnant patients. She follows pregnant patients in Pune. Um, and so she's one person who's sort of said, this is important and we need more information, um, not only in delivery of uh, diagnostics and interventions, but, but also in trying to understand mechanisms. And I don't know some of my ideas question. Can I say that, uh, you know, the gestational diabetes and TB is both, Yeah, no, so, so certainly um, diabetes, uh, correlates. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know how you tease apart gestational diabetes if there are enough patients with gestational diabetes and TB to really say. Um, it, I'm certain that, you know, both are risk factors. So it's I would speculate that gestational diabetes puts you at higher risk, but I don't know of data that prove that. Yeah, I, because that statement itself is very risky. Gestational diabetes is so yeah. Thank you so much. No, no, Patrick, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I think when you go back from here, you go with a lot of new thoughts, a lot <laughs> of food for thought, right? Yes, indeed. But thank you. A lot yeah. Of work to do. yeah, a lot of work to do. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. So I invite the director of marketing and having a lot of I'm <laughs> <laughs> 